the anatomy of the respiratory system. The principal organs of the respiratory system are the nose, the pharynx, the larynx, the trachea, the bronchi, and the lungs. Within the lungs, air flows along a dead-end pathway consisting essentially of bronchi, bronchioles, and alveoli. Incoming air stops at the alveoli, which are millions of tiny, thin-walled air sacs in which gas exchange occurs. The conducting zone of the respiratory system consists of those passageways that serve only for airflow. Essentially, this is from the nostrils through the major bronchioles. The walls of these passages are too thick for adequate diffusion of oxygen from the air into the blood. The respiratory zone consists of the alveoli and other gas exchange regions of the distal airways. The airway from the nose through the pharynx is often called the upper respiratory tract. The regions from the trachea through the lungs compose the lower respiratory tract. The nose has several functions. It warms, cleanses, and humidifies inhaled air. It detects odors, and it serves as a resonating chamber that amplifies the voice. It extends from a pair of anterior openings called the nostrils, and ends at a pair of posterior openings called the posterior nasal concha. The facial part of the nose is shaped by bone and hyaline cartilage. The inner chamber of the nose is called the nasal cavity. The nasal cavity is divided into right and left halves called the nasal fossae. The dividing wall is a vertical plate called the nasal septum and is composed of hyaline cartilage and bone. The vomer forms the inferior part of the septum, whereas the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone forms the superior part. The nasal cavity begins with a small dilated chamber called the vestibule that lies just inside the nostril. This space is lined with stratified squamous epithelium, like facial skin, and has guard hairs or vibrissae that block debris from entering the nose. Posterior to the vestibule, the nasal cavity expands into a much larger chamber. Most of this chamber is occupied by three folds of tissue the superior, middle, and inferior nasal concha. Beneath each concha is a narrow air passage called the meatus. Its function is to ensure that most air contacts the mucous membranes on its way through the nasal cavity. Most dust and unwanted particles from the air stick to the mucus and are prevented from going into the deeper respiratory passageways. Over most of the mucosa, the epithelium is called the respiratory epithelium. Its ciliated cells are capped with a fringe of about 200 motile cilia per cell and coated with a layer of mucus. The second most abundant cells of the epithelium are the wine glass shaped goblet cells. These goblet cells secrete most of the mucus. Inhaled dust, pollen, bacteria, and other foreign matter are trapped in the sticky blanket of mucus covering the epithelium. The cilia of the epithelium beat in waves that drive this debris-laden mucus posteriorly to the pharynx where it is swallowed. The particulate debris is either digested or passes through the digestive tract rather than contaminating the lungs. A small area of nasal mucosa has olfactory epithelium, which is responsible for the sense of smell or olfaction. The olfactory epithelium covers much of the roof of the nasal fossa and adjacent parts of the septum and superior concha. In the olfactory mucosa, the lamina propria has serous olfactory glands. These glands secrete a watery serous fluid that bathes the olfactory cilia and facilitates the diffusion of odor molecules from inhaled air to the receptors of the cilia. The pharynx is a muscular funnel extending from the posterior nasal apertures to the larynx. It has three regions, the nasopharynx, the oropharynx, and the laryngopharynx. The nasopharynx is distal to the posterior nasal apertures and superior to the soft palate. Inhaled air turns 90 degrees downward as it passes through the nasopharynx. Relatively large particles cannot make this turn and instead collide with the wall of the nasopharynx and stick to the mucosa near the tonsil where it will be disposed of. The oropharynx is the space between the posterior margin of the south palate and the epiglottis. The laryngopharynx lies mostly posterior to the larynx 
and extends from the superior margin of the epiglottis to the inferior margin of the cricoid cartilage, at which point the esophagus begins. The larynx is a cartilaginous chamber. Its primary function is to keep food and drink out of the airway. It also has evolved the additional role of producing sound and is commonly called the voice box. The superior opening of the larynx is guarded by a flap of tissue called the epiglottis. At rest, the epiglottis stands almost vertically. During swallowing, however, the epiglottis closes the airway, directing food and drink into the esophagus behind it. In infants, the larynx is relatively high in the throat and the epiglottis touches the soft palate. This creates a more or less continuous airway from the nasal cavity to the larynx. This allows an infant to breathe continually while swallowing. By the age of two, the root of the tongue becomes more muscular and forces the larynx to descend into a lower position, at which time it becomes impossible to breathe and swallow at the same time without choking. The inferior vocal cords, or vocal folds, produce sound when air passes between them. They contain the vocal ligaments that are covered with stratified squamous epithelium, best suited to endure vibration. The vocal cords and the opening between them are collectively called the glottis. The arytenoid cartilages abduct or adduct the vocal cords. Air forced between the adducted vocal cords vibrates them producing a high-pitched sound when the cords are relatively taut, and a lower-pitched sound when they are more slack. In adult males, the vocal cords are usually longer and thicker and vibrate more slowly, producing lower-pitched sounds than in females. Loudness is determined by the force of the air passing between the vocal cords. Although the vocal cords alone produce sound, they don't produce intelligible speech. The crude sounds from the larynx are formed into words by the actions of the pharynx, oral cavity, tongue, and lips. The trachea, or windpipe, is anterior to the esophagus and is supported by 16 to 20 C-shaped cartilaginous rings. The open part of the cartilaginous rings faces posteriorly, where it is spanned by a smooth muscle called the trachealis. This gap in the cartilage allows room for the esophagus to expand as swallowed food passes by. The trachealis contracts or relaxes to adjust airflow. The inner lining of the trachea is a pseudostratified columnar epithelium composed mainly of mucus secreting goblet cells, ciliated cells, and short basal stem cells. The mucus traps inhaled particles and the upward beating of the cilia drives the debris-laden mucus toward the pharynx, where it is then swallowed and eliminated from the body. This mechanism of debris removal is called the mucociliary escalator. Each lung is a somewhat conical organ with a broad concave base resting on the diaphragm and a blunt peak called the apex that projects slightly above the clavicle. The right lung is shorter than the left because the liver raises up higher on the right side. The left lung, although taller, is narrower than the right because the heart tilts towards the left, occupying more space on that side. On the medial surface, the left lung has an indentation called the cardiac impression, where the heart presses against it. Part of this is visible anteriorly as a crescent-shaped cardiac notch in the margin of the lung. The right lung has three lobes, the superior, middle, and inferior lobes. A deep groove called the horizontal fissure separates the superior and middle lobes, and a similar oblique fissure separates the middle and inferior lobes. The left lung has only a superior and an inferior lobe, and a single oblique fissure. Each lung has a branching system of air tubes called the bronchial tree. The bronchial tree extends from the main bronchus to tens of thousands of terminal bronchioles. Arising from the fork in the trachea, the right main primary bronchus is slightly wider and more vertical than the left one. Consequently, inhaled foreign objects lodge in the right bronchus more often than they do in the left. The right main bronchus gives off three branches, the superior, middle, and inferior secondary bronchi one belonging to each lobe of the lung. The left main bronchus gives off superior and inferior secondary bronchi to the two lobes of the left lung. 
In both lungs, the secondary bronchi branch into tertiary bronchi. Ten of these are located in the right lung and eight in the left. Each one ventilates a functionally independent unit of lung called the bronchopulmonary segment. The bronchioles are continuations of the airway that lack supportive cartilage and are less than one millimeter in diameter. The portion of the lung ventilated by one bronchiole is called the pulmonary lobule. Each bronchiole divides into 50 to 80 terminal bronchioles. These measure 0.5 millimeters or less in diameter and have no mucus glands or goblet cells. They do have cilia, however, so that mucus draining into them from the more proximal air passages can be driven back by the mucociliary escalator. This prevents congestion of the terminal bronchioles and alveoli. Each terminal bronchial gives off two or more smaller respiratory bronchioles. The respiratory bronchioles have alveoli budding from their walls. They are considered the beginning of the respiratory zone because their alveoli participate in gas exchange. Each respiratory bronchial divides into two to 10 elongated thin-walled passages called alveolar ducts. The ducts end in alveolar sacs, which are clusters of alveoli arrayed around a central space called the atrium. Branches of the pulmonary artery closely follow this bronchial tree on their way to the alveoli. The bronchial arteries service the bronchi, the bronchioles, and some other pulmonary and thoracic tissues, but they do not extend to the alveoli. The alveolus is a pouch that has about 95% of the alveolar surface area covered in squamous alveolar cells. The thinness of these cells allow for rapid gas diffusion between the air and the blood. The other 5% is covered by round boidal great alveolar cells. The great alveolar cells have two functions. First, they repair the alveolar epithelium when squamous cells are damaged. And two, they secrete pulmonary surfactant, which is a mixture of phospholipids and protein that coats the alveoli and smallest bronchioles. This prevents the bronchioles from collapsing when one exhales. Interestingly, the most numerous of all lung cells are the alveolar macrophages, or dust cells. These cells wander the lumens of the alveoli and connective tissue between them. These cells keep the alveoli free of debris by phagocytizing dust particles that escape entrapment by mucus in the more proximal parts of the respiratory tract. In lungs that are infected or bleeding, these macrophages also phagocytize bacteria and loose blood cells. The serous membrane, or pleura, lines the thoracic wall and forms the surface of the lung. It has two layers, the visceral and parietal layer. The visceral pleura forms the surface of the lung and extends even into the fissures between the lobes. At the hilum, it turns back upon itself, forming the parietal pleura. The parietal pleura adheres to the mediastinum, the inner surface of the rib cage, and superior surfaces of the diaphragm. The space between the parietal and visceral pleura is called the pleural cavity. The pleural cavity does not contain the lung. Rather, it wraps around the lung, much like the pericardium wraps around the heart. The pleural cavity contains nothing but a thin film of lubricating pleural fluid. The pleura and pleural fluid have three functions, the reduction of friction, the creation of a pressure gradient, and compartmentalization. Pleural fluid acts as a lubricant that enables lungs to expand and contract with minimal friction. Infection of the pleura can produce a condition called pleurisy, in which the pleura roughen and rub together, making each breath a painful experience. The pleura play a role in the creation of a pressure gradient that expands the lungs when one inhales. The pleura, mediastinum, and pericardium compartmentalize the thoracic organs and prevent infections of one organ from spreading easily to neighboring organs. Thank you for watching.